look so forward to today. This lesson, this study of this table has impacted my life like you would not believe. It's just, it's, you know, some of the things we've known, especially if, if we've been in a number of Bible studies, we pick up things here and there. And maybe some of you have studied the tabernacle before, but it's like any portion of scripture. Every time it's as if it's brand new. And we have those, I don't remember reading that before. I don't remember that before. I don't, you know, it didn't mean that much to me before. This really meant a lot to me. And so we um, are gathered basically around the table, Jesus Christ our Lord. And in the Hound of Heaven, that little poem that I hope you all who had indicated our first time had never read it. I hope you're finding it enjoyable. Someone has said of our poem for this series, The Hound of Heaven, quote, it's not a poem that re reveals itself in one reading. Now we might all agree with that statement. But invites us to a more in-depth study of the message, the story of our seeking happiness and the many ways in which we delude ourselves along the way. And that's what Francis Tom, in, in his uh, poem, The Hound of Heaven, he's revealing to us how God was pursuing as he was fleeing. And so the recognition in this little phrase here for, oh, there it goes, um, the recognition of the fact that he knew God's love was pursuing him. It was just that what he was after right then, he was afraid he would have to give up. And he was seeking for something that would fill him up, which is that God-shaped vacuum. Not recognizing that what he was going after wouldn't do it. It was in fact the one who was pursuing him that would do it. And so when we see these phrases like, fear was not to evade as love was to pursue. And I'm sure we use that multitudinous times in our conversations with people. Just flow right off of our tongue. But at any rate, what he's saying is fear does not know how to evade God's love. He was trying every way he could to evade God's love. It was not working. Behind him was the hound of heaven because God our creator loves us that much. He does not give up on us. That's how much he loves us. And so, but God's love knows how to pursue to the end till the dart of his love pierces our heart and we find what we were looking for all along that didn't fill that emptiness inside of us. God's love doesn't give up on the pursued one. And I just think that's so wonderful to remember as we're going through these little parts of the ark which is a type that God gave to the people of Israel as a type, a copy, a pattern of the reality of the Messiah that they were looking for. And then preserved it all these years so that we understand more of what it meant when God said, my goal, my heart's desire, what I am after is you. I want to dwell with you. And that's what we're learning here. And we looked last week and we looked at the ark and we saw how it pictured for us Jesus Christ and we saw the, the propitiation, the mercy seat. Because in that law was in that ark was contained the law, the Ten Commandments, to illustrate for us the impossibility of ever being able to gain access to God on our own efforts. And Galatians 6, or 3, excuse me, Galatians 3, 24, tells us that the law was a tutor. It was a tutor to teach us, to guide us, to open the door to the fact of, this isn't working very well, as hard as I try. And immediately, almost immediately, remember, they're out of Egypt. Moses tells them what God is saying, and they say, go for it. We're in agreement. We'll do this. And then Moses goes back up to heaven, and they have a calf that they're going to worship. So right away, you're only supposed to worship one God. Well, but we made this golden one, um, and a calf of all things. So, and I don't know how many of you have read F.B. Meyer. I bet a whole lot of you have, had, have read F.B. Meyer. He's one of my favorite authors. I have a number of his books. They're old. And you can probably get them for next to nothing at a garage sale or a, a thrift store. This is one of the great things about being a believer. Do you know one time I got a whole box of these really wonderful Christian books 
for free. I said, we don't know what to do with them. I said, well, I know what to do with them. And so I took them. But, but at any rate, this is great. You know, you go and, well, never mind. But at any rate, um, so this is what he says. The main inquiry for each of us all should be, what is God's ideal, God's thought, God's pattern? You caught the word pattern, I hope. And our one aim should be to understand it. Sure that to fulfill it is to have lived well. It may be that we shall have to fulfill the different portions of the tabernacle of our life without apparent connection with each other by diverse portions and in diverse manners, and we shall not understand the divine purpose. But at the end of life, we shall see that it was one complete and exquisite structure of which no part was wanting. That's what we're seeing in the tabernacle. We're seeing as we're putting it together, and we're looking at the table. And uh, I don't know, some of you have maybe even seen this in person. I, I never have. But it's the Arch of Titus. And when was the temple destroyed? Herod's temple, that final. When was um, the Jewish people sacked in Jerusalem by the Romans, by Titus? Do you remember when that was? Of course, you were alive now, I'm sure. <laughs> because it's a silly thing to say, isn't it? Do you remember when that was? Like, we were there. Don't you remember that? Uh, 70 AD, that's right, under Titus. And so when he comes in, they destroy the temple, and he takes all of these things out of the temple. This is part of what they were taking out of the temple. And there's the menorah, there's the table, and you see how relevant this was because this was quite a victory as far as they were concerned. It was a victory. And it's interesting, and as we read about these things, and then we know the history of Israel as we're moving, moving, moving along. If you know about the history of Israel, you're seeing God's timetable unfold. And that's part of what the tabernacle is. It's God's timetable leading to the time when the Messiah, the consolation of Israel, will finally come. And so, uh, how many of you have heard of the Balfour Declaration? Yes, okay, well, some of you have heard. At any rate, it was a declaration letter. Are to Lord Rothschild, and it was uh, to support the Jewish homeland. And it was way back in 17 when the treaty is finally fulfilled on November 2nd. So a hundred years ago. So now, however, we have the tabernacle a long time ago. God's using those people, He set them aside. They're supposed to represent him to all the heathen nations, the people around, as the God that is the only true God. So we see history unfolding, history unfolding in exact a compliance with the covenant that was made with Israel. That's what we're seeing on the big scene right now, where we're living right now. So then the temple is destroyed. A lot of things have happened in AD 70. There's this huge dispersion. So the Jewish people are all over the world now. They aren't in Israel. In fact, Israel is not. So this is what's happened. Then all of a sudden, you have this behind the scenes going on, and God is orchestrating. Then you have this Balfour Treaty. And then finally, do you remember what year that Israel... Again. Right, 1948. And so... A key time in God's timetable and his history as we're moving along, moving along, moving along, looking for the return of the Messiah that the tabernacle was pointing to that was built by the Jewish people. It was an assignment he gave to them. So we are living in history right now when you think about it. And the more we know from the Bible, the more we're going to understand what's on the news, if any of you watch the news. Some of you I've seen do. But at any rate, so what we're looking at, the first thing we do is we look at our scriptures and Exodus 25, 23 through 30, and look at it as, as many versions as you can, as you have available to you. That helps us better understand. Just sometimes a little difference in the words helps us better understand something. And um, so did you have anything that really stood out to you as you read those particular verses in various 
version. Very lavish. Yes, lots of gold. Yeah, yeah. Was re it's really interesting to read it, isn't it? Anybody else? Oh, go. Yes. It seems like that was an awful lot, doesn't it? She said she didn't realize that all those bowls and everything, how the table had all those things on it. It was, it was an interesting thing. Uh, probably the picture was at the side or something like that. But, yeah, really interesting. Anybody else? Yes. Right, exactly. She noticed that it was uh, the the materials that were used, like the like the ark. And um, thank you. So, question two. So, what Moses directed to construct? It goes right along with what you said. So, what does God tell Moses to do, to construct? A table of what? Acacia wood and and the gold. Okay. So, as she pointed out. Very reminiscent of the ark, right? So then we go and we have our research question. And, and as whatever resources you have, Bible dictionaries, different versions of the Bible, give different names used for this table. So what kind, what were the different names? Some of the ones that stood out to you for this table. Table of showbread. Yes. That was in a number of them, wasn't it? Showbread or shoebread, S-H-E-W, which is sort of interesting, the old uh, um, spelling. What else? The altar of the presence. Did you catch that? Of the presence. That, that really helps us better understand because then we're saying, what presence? What are we talking about here? So right away, and you know, some of this is headings on Bibles, like in the ESV, we have, have the, the heading and the, the table, but then within the context of the scriptures themselves, that's what's inspired. The headings are just to help us, and God led people to do that for us. What other things did you find? The table of the face? Yes, which is really an interesting way of putting it, isn't it? It's like we're looking at the face of God. This is, this is really fascinating. What else? Anybody else? The table of what? Say it once more loud. Oh, of sacred bread. Oh, what, what version was that we're in? Oh, of course, our friendly King James. <laughs> and it was, you know, for years, that's what we studied from was the King James. Um, what was yours? The altar of incense was in that, is right. In the, this is interesting, the Torah and uh, the Jerusalem, well, the Torah calls it the bread of display. If, if any of you who have a copy of the Torah, it's sort of fun to put it side by side. Oh, why are you laughing at me, people? <laughs> I have a copy of the Torah. I assume somebody else does too. <laughs> Any that are open that have Christian books for me. <laughs> well, we'll move right along there. We've got that settled. And then in question four, when we, we put together the information we've gained, then what's your impression of what this particular table is meant to represent for us? The type, the copy. What, what did you find? What did you come? What conclusion did you think of it? The what? The mercy seat as it, yeah, because it was headed for the mercy seat. There's a veil between. What else? The what? God's presence. So, so the, the different names that we've looked at, the different titles do help us. That there's a presence, a real presence. And then when you said face, the bread of the face, of face, and what else did you think of? Fellowship, key, that's a key word 
fellowship. When you think of the table, you think of fellowship. Fellowship with the presence. So now we're going through and we're seeing how very distinct this table is. And God is very precise so that we understand what he's showing us here. And uh, a, a table where there's a comfortableness, an interrelationship, something of depth is happening. And so in question five, then we saw that it was acacia wood overlaid with gold. We saw this, the acacia wood and the, uh, and the gold. What is this telling us? What is the acacia wood telling us? His humanity, his humanity, 100% God. So the gold is the deity. So again, we have that emphasis pointing us to Jesus Christ. When you think about it, you wonder what exactly was going through the mind of these Jewish people. Because they were looking for a Messiah, and you wonder about how much they understood. They would understand, of course, that this is the only way that you're going to get to the mercy seat, which is where God is. So all of this comes before we ever get to meet with God. So how this unfolds generation after generation after generation, preparing them to recognize when the Messiah finally comes. So that takes us to uh, question six and seven. And there we have the, the table or the graph, whatever it's called. Sarah wasn't here to remind me which it was. She's usually the one that tells me, no, it's a graph, it's not a table. And <laughs> it was too late, it was printed, I have no idea. So we're looking at these scriptures because what we're looking for is to totally get as much as possible our finite mind wrapped around what this is telling me about Jesus Christ. That's our question. What's this telling me about my Messiah? So we're looking for the object and we're looking then to highlight the who. So we look at these and we see these wonderful scriptures and so and they tell us a lot. If we pause, if we remind ourselves, I'm trying to learn what the Bible is getting across that has to do with a table. That's what we're doing with in regards to Jesus Christ. So what does this passage in 2 Samuel tell us? So we have that repeated object. What's the object? Table. And in this case, it's a king's table. Who's the king? David. So what is significant about this table? Kings had tables. So what is going on in this passage? Who are the people that are involved and why? So we have David who's a king. So what's going on? Yes, so he's, and, and so he wants to, I, I'm repeating because you can't be heard. Um, he wants to honor Saul, who was the king prior. What was Saul and David's relationship? It was not good, not good at all. And so now Saul, of course, had tried to kill David and because he knew David was going to become a king sometime. And who was David's evidently best friend? Jonathan. So here we have Jonathan. Who was Jonathan? Saul's son. So you see the intrigue that's going on. It's better than a mystery. Really, it is. And it's truth. So David and Jonathan have this wonderful relationship. What is the promise that David gives to Jonathan, his very best friend? What does he tell him? We need to know what this table is all about. What does he tell Jonathan? What does he promise Jonathan? Yes. Yes. And so his friendship is, is, it is based on such this closeness. And so he, he goes to Ziba, however you pronounce that, Ziba. He goes to him because he wants to know, is anybody left from the house of Saul? Anybody. And he finds out that Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, isn't that a great name? I love that name. I suggested to my granddaughter she named my great-grandson that. 
She says, you're kidding, of course. <laughs> and she didn't name him that. Anyway, so, so here is, it was like a covenant promise that he was going to promise, I won't forget you, David, because David said, you're going to be king. I know you're going to be king. And so he's king, and he goes and he makes sure that whoever is alive from Saul, he wants him taken care of. Was that the norm in that culture? No. What usually happened to anybody who was alive from the prior king? They were toast. Yeah. And so this was a very unusual thing that was going on, if we could only understand that. And so what does he want to do? So he's going to find Mephibosheth. He says, okay, bring him here. And what's he do? That's right. He says, Mephibosheth, I'm not only going to see that you survive, I'm not only going to provide some place for you, you come sit at my table. And, and what does it say about that table? So Mephibosheth ate at David's table, like always, and what else? That bottom line down there, like who? Like one of the king's sons, he says, this table, so there's a relevancy to the king's table. Only the important people, only the people he cares about are going to sit at that table. And you know what? I don't care that your father was my enemy. I care about my relationship with Jonathan. And I will keep my pledge to Jonathan. And so you come, you sit there, I will treat you as one of my sons. So this is really huge because there's the faithfulness of the covenant promise. Do you realize that when you go over and you read Acts and you read some of these New Testament things, there was a covenant made in the Godhead. The son promises the father, I will deal with this. I will be the sacrifice. I'm going to invite all those enemies right in to sit at the table here, which is me. Isn't that just the most... I mean, it, the story comes alive in such, such a, an overwhelmingly touching way when you really see it in the context of what God's telling us. So then we move on to something that's really familiar for most of us, the 23rd Psalm. And so now we look at this, and here's David again. But in this stage of his life, what was David doing? He was shepherding. He knew all about a shepherd. And so he sees the Lord as the shepherd. And so now, what is he saying? You know, this was another turning point of the three turning points of my life when I was in Israel. He, the one who was our teacher, leader, archaeologist guy, sort of like Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's who I think of. He's Raiders of the Lost Ark because that's what he was like. He was such an, it was a fun time. At any rate, he took us to this place and he said, this seems to be the place that David would have been writing from the, uh, when he wrote the 23rd Psalm. And I'm looking around and I think, you're kidding me. I see no green pastures. I don't see any water, much less nice clear water. This cannot be right. <laughs> but it showed the faith that God had, that God would provide. There were wild animals. He told us not to go off someplace because we could be eaten. And then, so imagine in David's time what it must have been like. So from that, we see our little key word. What was our key word we're looking for in each one of these? Our one word, table. So what do we learn about a table from this psalm? from the one who was to be king eventually. And what do we learn? Isn't this just so much fun? I just think it's more fun doing it with each other, you know. And so, so what was going on? Yes, his shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, his shepherd, his shepherd was going to prepare. Now that word prepare is the word spread out. So it could have been, sometimes it would have been a, a very low table that they could just carry with them, you know, that type of thing, and they're on the ground. Or it could be a mat. But there was a table that was prepared that was spread out. So, and, and what does it say? Before me in what? In the presence of my enemies. So we stop and we think, 
Okay, what am I learning about a table? As it has to do with the table here in the tabernacle, pointing me to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, my Savior, who died for me. What does it say? It says that Jesus Christ, my table, has prepared a table, and in the midst of a whole bunch of enemies, I'm just fine. Isn't that the truth? We who are in Jesus Christ, our table, who is also preparing a table, who is that one? He says, the world's going to hate you. There's going to be all sorts of tribulation. But you're still in me. So right in the middle of all of the enemies, do you know 300 plus Christians are being martyred every single day in the United States, not the United States, in the world, right now, every single day. And you know what it's done over in like Syria and some of these areas? They go in, they kill all the Christians who are meeting in the church. So what happens? The church is even fuller the next time. Is that an amazing testimony of the greatness and the goodness of God? You aren't going to defeat me. I belong to the Creator, the one who's sovereign, the one. We're just make sure that we all go to church now. Isn't that great? So you see this, this perfect comfortableness and fellowship that we have. And many expositors have coined the phrase hospitality language for this table. Spread out. Hospitality language. So the hospitality of our Creator whose heart's desire is to dwell with us is right here. And that's what part of what we're learning from this table in this tabernacle that's made of wood that they were familiar with and gold that would shine and sparkle. It's an amazing thing. So that takes us to our next scripture that we want to look at that tells us something about a table. And so now we fast forward from that time. The Messiah has come. The, the table, the tabernacle is walking around. The acacia wood, the gold, is walking around. There it is. And so what do we find? Our keyword is there. Our keyword is table. And so what do we find when we look at this? What's going on at this table? A what? Well, yes, a, a, a few little sinners are sprinkled in here and there. Isn't that right? So, so what kinds of things stood out to you when, you when you read about it, when you read that? What sort of bounced out at you? So we see there's the tax collectors and the sinners, and there's also his disciples, and they're there. And so he's reclining because that's the way they did it in that culture. You know, the picture of the Lord's Supper where they're sort of leaning on each other, that was their table. And with the cushions, and it was a very comfortable hospitable type of, of setting. And so there they are. And what's happening here? Yes. Right. What a good way to put it. She says, Jesus is anti-cultural again, and that whoever may come. So these people would have excluded tax collectors and sinners. You don't want these people at this table. That's not true at all. Jesus wants them. He invites them. He's pursuing sinners, just like us here. He's pursuing sinners, some who were so outrageously sinners that it was known by everybody. But he, that's and, and so he even explains to them, uh, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's what the temple, that's what the tabernacle, that's what the table was all about. You can't make it if you try to follow the law. I'm going to provide a way. I'm a God of mercy, and I desire fellowship with you. And so we move on, and we go to the next one. And what do we see there? This is a really sort of interesting passage, I think. So what do you find? Our key word is table. So we've got our, our, our table here. And what's going on at this table? So where is he? Yeah, he was invited. And so he's come and, and he's there. 
Yes, and ha and this woman, now notice, and behold. When you see behold, that means stop, pause, pay attention. Heads up. This is something really interesting. And so, behold, and so who is this woman? She's a, she's a known sinner, isn't she? A woman of the city, she was a known sinner. And now, the next phrase gives us a, another little hint about what was going on. What's the next few words say after she, who was a sinner? When she learned. So she wasn't invited. She learned. Jesus is over there. He's at this Pharisee's house. This Pharisee does not like you. But she goes, she gets her alabaster box, and she just goes and she crashes the party. She just comes in. This is fine with Jesus. And then look what she's doing. So, so what do we see going on here? Yes. So she takes this, she washes, and, and it's just an outpouring of her grateful, grateful, grateful heart right there at the table with these other people there. And so you see, Jesus is fine with the Pharisee. He's fine with the sinner. He hasn't come to save only one class. Well, in a way, he has sinners. And so, so he says, I, I have something to say to you, to Simon. So it's an interesting story. It's interesting, the whole thing about it, because she refused to be humiliated. She knew what those people thought of her. She knew she would not be welcomed by the ordinary people. But Jesus was different. Jesus was different. Jesus wanted her at the table. She was comfortable coming into the presence of Jesus. You see, in, in the tabernacle times, it wasn't comfortable to try to go into the place where God was. It was very uncomfortable because you were going to be struck dead. So that was, you know. <laughs> but, but that's the truth. That's what happened. I mean, you can't just walk in there. Something's got to be done about this sin. So now we all know that. They knew that. And here's this sinner and this man who's supposed to be very unique. He doesn't care. He's delighted. He's happy. You see, you see it unfold and unfold and unfold. But the table says, at this table, anybody's welcome. Anybody's welcome. And so we come to the next one. Did we go to the next one? Because it didn't look to me like we did. No, we didn't. Ah, there it worked. Okay, so now we have our key word again, which we know real well. What's our key word? Table. And so what's going on at this table? The, the Passover, the, that, that last supper, isn't it? And so we move from... Each one has a different kind of emotional context to it. And here we see like a poignancy, a solemnness, very much of what's taking place. And when you look here, you see the heart of God in two words, I have earnestly desired. Just think of that God-man, 100% man, 100% 100 God, a picture of the table. And he says, my heart's desire, just like what was said to Moses, that I might dwell in the midst of my people. And so he says, I earnestly have desired to eat this Passover with you. And so what does he tell them? What's going on? He's going to suffer. And he tells them that. I'm going to suffer. And it's the last time I'm going to have this supper with you, isn't it? And so when does he say it will happen again? When is it gonna when are they gonna be around in this kind of a situation again? Yeah, not till the end. It it, it says that then when he comes back, when all of this is fulfilled, when all that's unfolding, and we're watching parts of it unfold in our day and age, if we just open our eyes along with what we learn from scripture. As it's unfolding, there will come a time and the table will have another table ready for his people. And so that takes us. Um, anything else on that that you wanted to point out? Because when, when you see this, 
he clearly tells them that this is my body and this is my blood. And notice a, a key word that we'll get back to later in our lesson. This is the new covenant in my blood. So it's, it's really interesting what's happening. So he tells them, but there's going to come a future time and there's going to be another setting and we're going to be together once again. And it's going to be a very unusual because by then all of this will have unfolded. And that takes us to Revelation, to the, the, the next scripture that we're looking at. And what's going on in, in this at the end of time? What's happening? At the end of history, we're, we're clear over, we've passed the tribulation. Um, Y'all, this isn't a hard one. Yes, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And, and look at the rejoicing, the exultation. And so here's another table setting. And so who's the bride? We are. The church is the bride. So we're looking forward to this time when there's going to be this beautiful setting. And there's going to be all these people who have been invited. And so here we see... And the Lamb is who? The, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one who came, the one who was pictured as in the, in the tabernacle, in the, in the table. All of that. And now it culminates. Hallelujah. Rejoice. Exult. Because here it is. The time has come. You've received the invitation. Remember in the scriptures, when you read in the scriptures, it's gone out. I've invited people to my banquet. Have them come. And some of you probably sang the little song about, I cannot come. Didn't you used to sing that? Of course you did. Uh, from, from that portion of scripture. I'd sing it, but you wouldn't be happy. Then, So here's, here's a, a, a depiction of just a, a, a finite picture. Look, the hands of Jesus inviting in this beautiful table setting. And it goes on and on. And when we consider what happens at the table, hospitality, interaction, laughter, fun, sharing, all of that. And Jesus says, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. It's me. Isn't that just a cool thing to look forward to? So we're going to be there. Anything else on that before we go to the inquisitive mind? Yes. Yes, she's right. She pointed out how it, it does it in a simple way for children, but it's so profound. You know, it, it stretches our mind that this is really, really going to happen. Just like the Jewish people were gathered back together, no time in history has a dispersed people like that for all those years been brought back together as a people to become their nation again. Just like that happened. Just like the cross happened. Someday, this is going to happen. And won't that be fun? We can say, wow, this is so much greater than my wildest expectations. Remember that day when we were talking about a table? I had no idea how wonderful it was going to be. It's just amazing. So when God said, all of this is because I want to dwell with you. Just think of the person you admire the most, you respect the most, you love the most, and their burning desire is to be with you. And whatever it takes, they'll do it in order to be with you. And multiply that multitudinous time. And that's our creator. The one who knows every little quirky thing about us and knows when we've blown it and, and knows when we've decided, ah, maybe I'm not going to do that, God, even though I think the word's telling me to do it. That one. And he's got a table ready for us. And, and it's, it's this combination of who he is himself, the place of hospitality, the place of nurture, the place of acceptance, the place where you're brought into the king's family, just like David brought Mephibosheth. 
Isn't that just a wonderful way as we trace through just a little teeny word and we see, wow, that's what you're saying. Oh, no. Anybody else? Okay. So then for the inquisitive mind, um, and, and I bet that's all of you, what's missing from this table? We're, we're looking at this table, so we look at these particular scriptures, and what did you find that was missing from the table? The one in the tabernacle. Chairs. I mean, when you've got a table, uh, you, you guys, we put a, I didn't, but chairs were put up for, for you all. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be tiresome if you're standing there at first on one foot and then on the other foot, and, and you're trying to, and because there's no chair for you? So, so in the tabernacle, there were no chairs, none whatsoever, um, no cushions, nothing. There was the table. And so then when we go to uh, Exodus 12, 11, when you look up Exodus 12, 11, what did you find? What was interesting about God's instructions now to these people? Say what? Right. There's, they don't have time to sit down because this was right as they were getting ready to, for God to lead them out of Egypt and they were supposed to have their shoes on, their staff ready, and they were supposed to eat their food. And then when God told them at just the right time, we're moving. So, so they're preparing to get ready and there's not any time for anything else. They don't have time to sit down. They've got to be ready. So then we go over to the New Testament and in 1 Corinthians 11, what do we see? What's going on in that passage goes with that inquisitive mind that you looked up all sorts of stuff. There was what? Yes. So here we have what we do. We commemorate the, the Lord's Supper, don't we? We have that. Um, we, in our church, we're just seated at it, usually just... I wonder, do churches have pews anymore? Does everybody have chairs? Some have pews? Yeah. I always wanted a pew with my name on it because every once in a while I come to church and somebody's taken my seat. <laughs> I don't get that at all. <laughs> and so, But at any rate, so we have this communion. And even the term communion helps us to understand what's going on. There's a communion a, 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 a togetherness we're in something together and so we go and we see how it's just filled out filled out filled out and then we finally get to that marriage supper of the lamb and so in question eight we move on and we learn a little bit more about what was in that particular area of this tabernacle what's the purpose of the the poles and the rings because we saw these poles and rings before what are they for yeah so that the table could be carried, so that you're not touching these things, you're just touching the things you're supposed to be touching. And so then nine is that thought question. So when you consider the history of Israel at that time, then what do you see as the circumstances? So we know it was for carrying the table, and so what do you learn about it? Yes, yes. Most of us do not have something like that to carry our table around. I mean, we're assuming that table is going to be there for a period of time. Not these people. When you think about it, they, like that had been right before they left Egypt, you need to be ready to go right now. No chairs. You're too busy. You've got an assignment to do, which is never done. You have to do it again and again and again and again, so you're never finished. So you don't have time to sit down. And furthermore now, you don't, ha ha you don't have any idea of when I'm going to tell you to move out. So you need to be ready to go at all times. And that's interesting because when you think about it, we really don't know what God's going to tell us to do next. We just know what God's told us to do right now. And we need to be ready and pliable. Okay, God, you sort of changed directions on me here because I planned to go here. I planned my life out when I was 11. That's when I first saw the man who was going to be my husband, except he didn't know it. He was playing basketball 
And an 11 year old seeing a handsome hunk of a guy who turns out to be funny. Yeah, I, so I told my girlfriend, that's who I'm marrying. And I did. <laughs> Not when I was 11. <laughs> I, I didn't marry him when I was 11. At, at any rate, so yeah, I was 18. Anyway, so, um, so then they had to be ready to go immediately. When their bridegroom says, go, you go. And so what were they instructed to make then in question 10 in Exodus 25, 9 and 29? They were busy, weren't they? And it seemed like it didn't really take them that long when I look at all the things they were busy doing. And so God gave them the skills to do it. But so what were they instructed to make now? Pardon? Yes, they were to make that sanctuary a, a place of this comfortableness, all of this for God himself. And what else in these scriptures were they to make? All sorts of furnishings. And then what else? Yeah. This sounds like a huge assignment, really, doesn't it? Make, make the plates, make the dishes, uh, flagons, bowls. All of these kinds of things they were supposed to make. Uh, and, and a flag on, I looked it up because I didn't know what an F-L-A-G-O-N was. Did you guys know what it was? Did you look it up? Oh. Um, well, at any rate, it, it can be a number of different designs. But basically, it would be something that had a lid and a handle to it. So it would be a little bit different than the other kinds that you're thinking of that we are accustomed to. The Torah said that they, it was to be made um, and jugs with which to offer libations, which we'll look at in just a, just a little while. So there was all this going on, and in number 7, in question 11, so in number 7, we have the, sort of this description of all these utensils, all these vessels that have to be made. So when we read that, when we look at that, in the Numbers passage, uh, what stood out to you? What key phrase did you find that helps us understand this? There's a repeat. There's uh, a key phrase. Pardon? Twelve. A key number. Number twelve. A key number. And then what else is a key phrase in there? Right. Right. There's another aspect because it, it gave the assignment to from the chiefs of Israel. So there's these chiefs of Israel, and as she pointed out, there's how many of them? There's 12 of them. So the, 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 the number 12 would present to us what? When you think of there were 12 chiefs, 12 tribes. So that tells us there was a chief for each tribe. And so the number, the total number, would represent then what? Those 12 represent, and then when you think of all of the different 12, 12, 12, what are, what's being represented here? The whole nation. The whole nation. Because nobody but the priests got to go in there. The regular people didn't get to go in and out. It was the chiefs, each one representing their tribe. And do you see how this points us to Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ represents all of us. It was as if we all were there on the cross. It was our sins that were taken care of. And God pictures that for us again and again. So only the chief priest could go in. Nobody else from that tribe was allowed in there. He went in. He went about the duties. He had the responsibility. So he was representing all those other people as if all of them were going and doing all of this. Just like Jesus did. Remember? He exchanged his righteousness for our sin. So rather than us hanging on that cross for all of eternity, because you do realize we could never pay for our sin compared to God's holiness. It could never have been, it could not have been done. So somebody had to come along and do this who was qualified. That was Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, gold in a crystal wood. 
Isn't it cool how you see it unfolding, unfolding, and it just, it's like it goes off in your head and you go, of course, they're just aha moments all the time. And so uh, when, when we look at all of this back and forth and back and forth in question 12, what's the adjective that's used in Leviticus 24, 7? Pure. And what do you think of when you think of pure? It's what? Perfect. No flaws of any kind. It can't be just any old frankincense. You can't tweak it to smell like you want it to smell like. It's got to be exactly. It's got to be pure. It's got to follow the exact detail of how I instruct you to do it. You can't make a shortcut out of it. You can't do any of that because I'm going to strike you dead if you do. I mean, it's serious. What, what they were doing was serious because it was in effect making a way for God to be dwelling in their midst. It was not to be taken lightly and it was to teach them this huge lesson basically of how very much their God loved them. All of that showed the love that their God had for him. Of all the peoples of the world, they were the chosen people who were to be that wonderful vessel that we keep repeating because we need to remind ourselves this is what, what our mission is too, to represent Jesus Christ to a fallen people. That's what they were doing. And so then we look in 13, how would all this then apply as a type portraying Jesus Christ? So, so we're looking at the frankincense. And, and we've got our mind tuned on this path. We want to see it unfold. We go and we look in Matthew 2.11. And what did you learn in connection with frankincense? It was a, yes, and it was, it was a gift given to Jesus. And the gift was from, from the wise men. And the wise men were Gentiles. Isn't that fascinating? Do you see the table coming together with Gentile, with Jew? Do you, it, little teeny things as we build on what we already know, we see just how, how wonderful this is. So here's this frankincense. And this was one of the gifts that would be given to a king. It was specifically, it was very important what they did. They wanted to go see the king. Well, when you go see the king, you bring the right thing. So they bring frankincense to the king, who's a little baby, and of all places, a manger, a trough. Who knows what kind of smells and what was going on. And so, so we see this, and as we try to put together what God's saying to us, it falls into place. And then in B, when we look at 2 Corinthians, what do we learn in 2 Corinthians? Pardon? Yes. And so in 2 Corinthians, we are told that we are to be the fragrant aroma of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself is that fragrant aroma that was pictured or typed in the frankincense that the king, that the wise men brought to the king because he was the king. And now when we receive Christ, we receive that frankincense, which is meant to be taken all over the place. So we walk into a room, the smell should change. I mean, forget that Febreze or whatever that stuff is they advertise. We're supposed to come in to a room and the smell in the room changes. It's not so stinky anymore. Really, when you think about it, when you think of the picture that's being brought, there's a sweetness. There's a whole difference that we should bring, even if we aren't quoting John 3.16 to the people. Yes. Yes. You are exactly right. She pointed out how it does come in. We find the people around us don't swear. Um, uh, a friend of mine, when she went away to college, she comes back. 
and she wa she asked me to go to the movies with her. She said, I think you would really like this movie. We go to the movie, we come out, and she says, well, what did you think? And I said, I thought it was a good movie. And she said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed. She says, I watched this with my friends, and I never had a problem. But soon when I was sitting by you, and I heard some of the language, I thought, oh, oh my gosh. I n had not said anything to her about that. I didn't cover my ears. I didn't cover my eyes. I didn't do any of that. I thought, well, this is strange. I said, well, she says, I said, why would you be so embarrassed? She says, I don't know. It was just sitting next to you that made me feel like this wasn't right. So, and it's none of us. See, that's the thing. I didn't go planning, how can I make her feel bad? I mean, you go, and it's that fragrant aroma that Jesus himself wants to permeate the room with, to draw people to himself. Yes. Yes. You are so right. Did you all hear her? It could be as simple as a smile, and you smile, and it makes a difference to that other person, and you realize, I didn't even realize I was smiling, you, you know? And that's because when God says, it is me working in you to will and to work, in Philippians he says that, it's the Holy Spirit. If we'll just lose him, He's just fine. He makes all sorts of impressions and we don't even realize it. Isn't that great? So we see the significance of these things. It becomes overwhelming when we examine it, doesn't it? So then we, we look at these drink offerings and we would ask ourselves, what do we learn from the following scriptures? So in Numbers 28, 7, what did you learn in 28, 7? Okay, there was the precision of the amount, correct? And what else? And it was what? Yes, and the place where it was to be poured was in that holy place. It couldn't be poured outside of the tabernacle or outside of the tent. It had to be in there. And what else do we learn? Yes, it was a strong drink. Is that what you were going to say? Right, right, right. It could not be watered down in any way because it was to be a picture of the perfection. So it had to be a strong drink. It makes us even think of what Jesus did in the New Testament with the wine at the wedding, remember? And they said, boy, you gave us the great wine. Usually that's not the way they do it. But Jesus did that. And so then in Genesis, what do we find when we look at these scriptures in Genesis? This is the first that, that we know of in the New Testament that it mentions a drink offering. And there's that rule of thumb. It helps us understand when we look at how it was used the first time in scripture. Something was used. And so what is the setting there in Genesis 35, 14, and 15? What was going on? Yes, it was Jacob, and, and, and it was him that was doing the offering. And, and what was the name of the place, and, and why was he doing it? It was what? Ye Bethel, the house of God. So, and what had happened at that time? It says, what happened to him? What happened? Yes. So there was an encounter, something going on with God. And we notice then when there's this encounter with God, when there's something going on, frequently there's a, a, a drink offering so, or some sort of an offering to commemorate what had just happened. It was a, a change point in the life of Jacob. And he wanted to honor God because this uh, was a remarkable thing in his life that had just occurred. And so we see the relevance of it. And then in Exodus 29, 
what do we see? How often, well, well, I'm sorry, did I go ahead without you? Yes, yes, when he did it. The oil of the Holy Spirit, you know, when you think of the anointing oil and you think of that kind of thing, yes. So then in Exodus 29, yes, day by day, regularly, morning, at twilight, on and on. It just never ceased, did it? You can see why they didn't have time to sit down. I mean, you just got to be doing this again and again and again and again. Uh, and, and sometimes just in life, in the pragmatics of life, not spiritual, but you think of the things you have to do again and again. It's never finished. Like my kids could not figure out how come they had to make up the bed. I mean, you're going to get in it pretty soon. Why do we have to make that? This seems like a waste of time. And the older I get, I thought, eh, maybe you don't have to make up the bed after all. I'm by myself. Who cares? I don't know. You used to always do that. Oh, gosh. By the end of the year, you will know so much about me. It will only be the grace of God that you even interact with me. So then, Numbers 15, 1 through 10. What was it to the Lord? What does it tell us? What? Isn't that amazing? It's a pleasing aroma or fragrance, depending on your version of the Bible, to the Lord. And it says that. Did some of you highlight how many times, every time it said that in those few verses, 1 through 10? Did anybody do that? Because you, Carolyn, did you, is that what you were saying? <laughs> but so when you see something that's repeated in such a, you know, a really brief amount, three times it was in, in the version I'm using, the ESV, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. That's what it was to him. And so what stood out to you as you looked through this? Did something, as you looked up these scriptures in, in question 14, did something stand out to you? <laughs> Boy, was that profound. God is very different than us. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the, so that's true. The depth of the meaning to God. We we have to think, okay, this is interesting, but how come it meant that much to God? What was it saying? So when it says this pleasing aroma to the Lord, and we know it represents Jesus Christ and him sacrificing. We know that's eventually where it's going. Why would that be very pleasing to God? It's his de yes, it's his design. If he wants to dwell with us, there has to be a way made. So as it pictures this, then we see that it's a pleasing aroma because it's pointing out access to him, what is going to make possible that access to him. So we see that we're going to look at it again in a little bit more depth as we put it together. And so um, in the Torah and the Jerusalem Bible, it talks about libations, and that's the word that's used there for these offerings. And among the Hebrews, these were poured on the victim after it was killed. Isn't that interesting? And the several pieces of it were laid on the altar, ready to be consumed by the, by the flames. So in all the different ways that you use these libations, they consisted of in offerings of bread, wine, and salt. So it's a wide range which I never understood before until I started looking it up in various and sundry places and saw that. So then when we think of Jesus as that libation that was poured out for us around the table of the, uh, the communion when we're together, it starts to pull it together more. And we can think when we're there on communion Sunday and we're taking communion, wow, this is the blood 
This is the body, and this is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. How fascinating that is. The cost, the cost. And then Paul, in the Timothy and Philippians passages, he, he talks about being poured out as a drink offering. In other words, I love the Lord so much, and I love you all so much, I'm willing to sacrifice even myself. He wasn't saying that he was like Jesus, except the sacrifice was worth it because of what would be changed in their life when they responded to the message he had. And we know he sacrificed a lot. So in 15, the deduction question, how would you describe the purpose of the drink offering as you consider question 14? Pardon? Yes, it gives us a picture of the completed work of Jesus as we look forward. And so we again are, are just struck with the joy of God at the completed work of his son. When Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. The work is done. It's finished. God's work was accomplished. And remember, that's the fulfilling of the covenant that was made in the Godhead. So then in 16, we put together some scriptures that are really interesting. The first one, we looked up Luke 22, 20. And what did you learn when you looked at 22, 20? What do you learn? Because now the table, the offering, the drink offering, all, and now we're over into the New Testament, the Messiah has come who's been pictured. And what do we learn? Yes. And this cup that is poured out for you, which we know is the blood, because Jesus explained it. He identified what it was picturing. We know that these Jewish people were used to cups being poured out as an offering. This was part of ingrained in their history with God. So they took it that they repeated again and again and again and again and again and should have been, wow. And so this is what he said. For you is the new covenant in my blood. So now we go back and we see in Exodus 24, how many of you looked in your cross-reference of Luke 22, 20? Good for you. What did you find? <laughs> she gets a start. <clears throat> yes, I do too. <laughs> oh my goodness. I I just looked at three. That's interesting. Did you want to summarize for us? Or what stood out to you? Yeah, so, so the, when God gives it to Moses, and then, it, isn't that interesting? Because he doesn't need us, but he again and again, we see he always uses us. And mine, it sent me to one of the places was 24-8. So I backed up, which I always do, and then it started with just exactly what Joanna was pointing out to us. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. Absolute word, all. And all the people, absolute word, all the people answered with one voice and said, all, absolute word, the words of the Lord is spoken, we will do. So that was a covenant. That was a covenant. This is the law. This is what I'm telling you. Okay, I'll do it. All right. So then we move 
and we we look at this the new covenant in my blood we know that the Jewish people would have understood right away covenant because this is what they were, a covenant people. They would have grasped that. We do it too. We just probably don't always call it a covenant. Although sometimes in housing developments, you have a covenant. You sign before you could move in. And so Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, so now this was right, they're getting ready to make the tabernacle. Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. You agreed, a covenant has been made, but there has to be the shedding of blood. It has to be the shedding of blood. And so here was the covenant. The other cross-reference that I looked at when I looked these up um, was in Hebrews, and it sent me to Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, key word peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by what? The blood of the what? The eternal covenant. Aha! We're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. I understood there was a Mosaic covenant, there was the Abrahamic covenant, there was the Davidic covenant, there's all these covenants. Now he's talking about by the blood of the eternal covenant covenant jesus blood is shed something moves into something new and so when we look and we just keep looking and looking at the scriptures that keep sending us somewhere else and we see in hebrews 8 he's speaking now to the nation of israel hebrews the the 1320 was speaking to the church jew and gentile but he says behold the days are coming declares the lord when I will establish a new covenant with who? The house of Israel and of Judah. In other words, the whole nation. Now there's going to come a time we're moving as Israel's back in its land. Israel has become a state. Everybody hates Israel. It's getting worse and worse. The anti-Semitism, it's getting more vocal. It's getting more obvious. It's not hidden. And time's going to come and it's going to keep coming. And then there's going to be finally a tribulation period. Then there's going to be an ingathering of the nation of Israel. They're going to mourn when they realize what their nation has done, what their people have done. They've pierced Jesus. You can look that up in the prophets. And so you see then, he says, but that covenant that you were under, that conditional covenant, I am making a way for that. The tabernacle's pointing to the one who is the way, Jesus Christ. His blood shed far better than any blood of a cow or a, a lamb or any of that. It's pointing to Jesus. Now here, I'm giving you a covenant. And now it's not going to be written on things that are put into the ark. It will be written on your heart. Furthermore, I will open your mind and heart to receive it and live it. So we don't need that anymore because it's all been fulfilled. And this is going to, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Looking forward to that time. This is the covenant we are under as the church. We have a new heart. We have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit alive in us. Our eternal covenant, the one made with Christ, once we have, have uh, uh, the, the pursuer has hit that dart in our heart, we have become one of his own. We are secure at that table of the king forever and ever and ever. No more drink offerings have to be poured out. No more lambs have to be slaughtered. And we're secure in that. We don't have to worry and have somebody go make another sacrifice because we just blew it right after we, we were forgiven for the last thing we blew. And so isn't that wonderful? That's where we are. As we look at this tabernacle, we see how time has passed and where we are now, and where we will be at a table celebrating, and then the nation of Israel will have been brought together. The pursuer wins. The pursuer wins over evil all the time. And so, uh, I'm hurrying. How often was it, 17, how often was the bread of the presence at, uh, to, the, to be placed on the table? All, all the time wasn't it but then on every sabbath it was to be changed so here was warm bread and in the meantime 
they ate off of the other bread. And then that had to be taken off. So the Torah calls it the bread of display. It was displayed for all those times. Then it was replaced. It was displayed. And so um, Leviticus 24.8 talks about that. And then in 18, how does Jesus himself connect who he is to the bread of presence on the table in the holy place? And we looked at these scriptures. What did you find in John and in Matthew and in the others that you might have wanted to look up? The bread of life. The words themselves are wonderful, aren't they? He is the bread of life, not the bread of death. He's the bread of life. What else? Yes. So it's not this bread that tomorrow we're going to need more bread or, or however that goes. Anything else? And, you know, to eat off of that bread all the time is to have his word. So we have Jesus Christ, the, and then we have his word, which is also could be represented as the bread because it's what feeds us. It's what keeps us on track. It's what the Holy Spirit uses to convict us. Then in digging deeper, um, when you consider what goes into making the flour, what does it help us understand? How does that help us understand what um, Jesus Christ? How does that help us? What do they do to make the flour? Yeah. Yeah, they break it. They pound on it. They do all sorts of stuff. It, 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 it strike it. And so when we look in Isaiah, what do we see about Jesus? Yeah, yeah, he was like that being, because look, he was, uh, he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, he was stricken, smitten, afflicted, pierced, crushed, the chastisement that brought us, notice our little key word that keeps popping up, is peace. It brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. And so then in Matthew, what did you find? What was going on in this Matthew 4, 1 through 11? Yes. And the devil comes in one of his things that he says, yeah, is the bread. You're hungry. What about bread here, you know? Try, tempting him again and again. And... It's interesting that he would choose that bread because he's talking to the bread of life. When you look at all the little innuendos that maybe aren't written out, but you see it. Did anybody have another scripture? What I took away was when you consider what is available, when you look through these scriptures and you see that at the table there's peace and when you consider where we are as children of God as the church if you have not received Christ now would be a really good time and then you are part of the body of Christ and so when we gather together around that table Jesus Christ all the significance of it I'm fairly confident that if we took a poll here we would find some Democrats, some Republicans, some Independents, some who never watch the news and could care less about politics. And and you think, but we come together around the table, Jesus Christ. And and some of you, one of my very dearest, long lasting friends, we've been friends for over forty years. I love her to pieces. She's a blessing to me. We do not agree on politics. But that doesn't ruin our friendship because we are at the table of the one who has made us one in him. And so we can't let those things interfere. They're irrelevant. We have peace. So the first of all, who found the principle you want to share? We're open to hear what your principle was. We really want to hear it. But we can't if you don't tell us. Did anybody write a principle? I did. So I will share mine. <laughs> so, Jesus is the table where we find peace and fellowship with God and with one another. And all God's people said, Amen.
thank you, ladies. You are kind. You're forgiving. You're so patient. Have a good time with your small group. If you didn't hear, Carol, if you ordered one of the little pamphlet things on the tabernacle, if you ordered one of these, go to Carol. She's got it for you.